Episode 23 of Tartarian Truthers with your hosts, Casey and Jojo. This week, we are going to try, with the emphasis being on try, to explain the mystery of the obelisk. So what are they? What do they represent? Where did they originate? Why are they in major cities all over the world, but also in smaller cities and towns all over, including here in Australia? Yeah, all great questions, Jojo, because to be totally honest with you, before researching this episode, I did not know all the answers to these questions. It really is such a common yet mysterious monument. But can I just say that almost Every little town I've driven through in Victoria and South Australia has an obelisk in it. They are everywhere. They sure are. But we want to know why, right? So to get started, we have to go all the way back to ancient Egypt. To the early Egyptians, the obelisk was the shape sacred to the sun god Ra the creator of humanity, the source of all heat and light, the being on whom man was totally dependent. But by the fifth dynasty, Ra had become so popular, he was elevated to the role of state deity. His main center of worship was on Heliopolis, where the first kings erected primitive obelisks, rough hewn and truncated, but tipped off by the pyramidian shape, which distinguishes obelisks from other monumental columns. These prototype obelisks were first known as Benben stones. The spirit of the sun god was supposed to enter the stones at certain periods, and on these occasions, human sacrifices were offered to it. The victims were usually prisoners of war and other foreigners, but when neither of these were available, it is said that the priests plucked people from their own native population to sacrifice. Brutal. In Heliopolis, king after king erected Benbens in Ra's honour, so that by 1300 BC, the city was full of obelisks, some decorated with gold to resemble the sun's rays, others with inscriptions glorifying Ra's daily passage through the skies or hailing earthly occasions such as victories, feasts and jubilees. The pharaohs of later dynasties switched their obelisk erecting affections to Osiris. Osiris was known as the god of the earth, vegetation and the Nile flood that gave life to all of Egypt. Also the god of rebirth, the god of the underworld, and the last judgment in life and death. As this cult became ever more popular, the priests at Heliopolis shrewdly grafted it onto Ra worshipping by claiming that Osiris was actually Ra's grandson. This ensured that Heliopolis remained the greatest religious centre in Egypt and the entire Mediterranean region. The Egyptians found Osiris particularly attractive because of the bittersweet story of his life, death and reincarnation. This has been told many times in many ways, but the version that we are about to share with you is the most popular and the one that has been taken on by Masonic historians as it suits their ritualistic needs. So this is Osiris. Osiris was the king of Egypt at the time of this story and he married his sister Isis. His brother Set wished to usurp the throne and so plotted Osiris's death. He tricked Osiris into climbing into a golden chest. As soon as he was inside, Set nailed down the lid and flung the chest into the river Nile. It was carried off to Byblos in Syria, where it came to rest against an acacia tree with the now dead Osiris still inside. 
Isis found out what Set had done to Osiris, so she set off to find her husband. A vision led her to Byblos, where she recovered his body and took it back to Egypt, where Set stole his brother's corpse from her and tore it into 14 pieces, scattering them throughout Egypt to prevent Osiris from ever returning to life. Isis recovered all but one of the pieces and gave Osiris a burial fit for a king. Their son Horus avenged his father by slaying Set and another of Osiris's sons, Anubis, then resurrected Osiris using the lion grip. Having triumphed over the grave and amongst the living once more, Osiris retired to his reign as king and now also the judge of the so-called dead. The piece of Osiris that was never recovered was his penis, which Set had thrown into the Nile, where it was unfortunately eaten by fish. The ever resourceful Isis manufactured an artificial organ around which the Egyptians established a cult and festival. From this, it is concluded that the artificial organ is represented by the obelisk, making it a phallic symbol of fertility. Wow. Okay, well, that was pretty hectic, wasn't it? Brutal, even. But I guess that means that the obelisks that we see all over the world represent giant penises. Is that what you got out of that foray into ancient Egyptian history, Jojo? Yeah, you know what? Kind of. But there was also a brief mention of the Shmishmations in there too, Casey. What have they got to do with obelisks? Yes, so we have mentioned Shmishmations in previous episodes, especially in the building blocks of Australia Part 2, where we discovered that many of Australia's so-called founding fathers and even modern-day prime ministers are in this group. But, I mean, they're just a group of lovely, upstanding men who do a lot of great work for their local community, aren't they? Uh, Yes, supposedly. Well... That's what we're told, but there's been quite a few whistleblowers over the years, and it seems that after you get to a certain level in this organisation, things start to change. Hmm. So these are some short excerpts that we took from a much longer video of a man named Victor Ramos, who was a police officer and master mason, which is one of the higher degrees that you can get to in Shmish Masonry but not the highest. So let's have a listen to what he has to say, shall we? All right, brother. You said that you had also uh, Masonic, right? Yeah. Well, my career in law enforcement, I actually joined the Brotherhood of Freemasons. uh, Okay. Okay. How'd you get into that? How'd you get into that? Man, you know, a lot of cops are involved with that. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's it's, uh, it's a thing that I'm not saying you must do, but... 95% 95% of them do. You know what I mean? Now, uh, what's the benefit out of it? Like, what, what's what's the main purpose? Of actually, five? for me, if you're going to ask me the question, I think it was more like biblical history. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. What intrigued me the most was they, you know, they talked about King Solomon's temple and mm-hmm. the Holy of Holies, and I've always been intrigued by it. So this actually exists? Yes, it does. It's your cult. There's nothing to be messing with. Okay. I'm going to tell you straight up. All right. Uh, and there's three phases. Uh, first year, I mean, the first phase is an apprentice. Okay. Uh, even before you get to that phase, uh, you got to be uh, pretty much uh, spoke about. Okay. You know, to be one, you have to ask one. So uh, one of my uh, supervisors, he was a lieutenant, um, pretty much came up to me and asked me, hey, you, you want to join a club? And I'm like, what kind of club is it? You know what I mean? <laughs> See, what they do is they bring you into the temple mm-hmm. and they have the secretary, which is a male. We're all males. Mm-hmm. There's no female masons here. I know in Europe, I think they do, not here. Unless you're an Eastern star, that's different. Okay. But the Freemasons, the blue, the, you got the Blue Lodge, which is composed of all different nationalities and, and, and backgrounds of, of, of masons. Right. To include different religious sets. Hindu, Muslim, whatever. You could be atheist, they don't care. You could be Satan. You could be a devil worshiper. Wow. And they'll bring a devil worshiping Bible, right? That satanic Bible, so you could wow. you take the oath. Yeah, they don't care. See, I didn't know that mm. until I started doing more homework on it. Now, what did I get myself into? But did you ever get that far? 
Oh yeah, I became a master mason. Okay. I mean, the far, the the highest you go is thirty third, but okay. even at thirty second, the, the, see from the ranks of thirtieth to thirty three, which is three. Uh, that's when they there was the, the the actual truth to you. I got you. You know, which they have you in darkness all those years, and then once you start climbing up the the you know the rituals and the phases, and mm -hmm. you go up the the ranks or degrees, <clears throat> right. we call it. Uh, you could go from the third degree to the thirty second degree in a weekend. <clears throat> wow! Oh yeah, you could do it in two days. They call that the fast track. But usually to get that high, it takes years. Wow. It take it takes years. But you could do it the other way. You got to pay some money or talk to whoever. Wow, that's interesting and kind of scary too, huh? It's like these men don't really know what they're getting themselves into when they join this ancient organization. And most of them won't know the whole truth unless they get to the higher degrees. So do we know why they like obelisks so much then? So we have to go back in time to the Freemasons of the 1800s when to them, apparently the obelisk was the only architectural symbol of Osiris still in existence. And to them, there could be no greater proof of Masonic ascendancy in the modern world than Egyptian obelisks, which they then thrust into the heart of the West's greatest cities. These obelisks would also symbolize Boaz and Joachim, the twin pillars, which Masons claim were built in front of Solomon's temple in imitation of two obelisks at the entrance of Egyptian temples. These are mentioned even in the Book of the Dead, the texts which every affluent ancient Egyptian had placed in his tomb to make sure he was resurrected in the kingdom of Osiris. So the Shemeshmations are really into ancient Egyptology. Is that what the entire organisation is based on? Well, Kind of, but a lot of people, me included, don't realise how steeped in Egyptian history Shemesh masonry really is. I mean, check this out. This is the Egyptian room at the Royal Arch Masonic Temple in Petersham, Sydney. It was originally a part of the Royal Arch Temple built in College Street, Sydney, but was demolished in the 1960s. But before the wreckers got to work, the Egyptian room was dismantled and stored away until it was re-erected at the new Royal Arch Centre in 1977. The mayor and other important town dignitaries came to the opening and admired the painstaking care with which the Egyptian room had been transferred from the old temple. So around the walls, there's a mural of paintings taken from the Book of the Dead, including images of Osiris, the god of light, and the god of the quick and the dead. So do all Masonic temples have an Egyptian room then? No, not all of them. But I'm still yet to learn what it is that constitutes one temple or lodge having an Egyptian room over another. So if anyone knows, please share with us in the comments below. This leads us to wonder about the monumental obelisks around the world. And there are three major ones that are of importance. This one is in St. Peter's Square at the Vatican in Rome, Italy. And it has been placed in such a way that every Pope who, is, who addresses any crowd in the square must face the obelisk. And this one is in Central Park, New York City. It was brought to New York from its original location in Alexandria in Egypt in 1881. Its four sides are covered in hieroglyphs. And according to the book, The New World Order by A. Ralph Epperson, these drawings have been translated by a variety of Egyptologists, including some Masonic writers. And they have told the readers of one of their publications that this obelisk was quarried to praise and adore the divinity of the sun, worshipped by ancient Egyptians as the source of light and life. It is a representation of the god Ra, or the sun. Kind of odd, right, that there's a symbol for the sun in the middle of New York City? Very odd. And now the third one 
is the Washington Monument, which was constructed to honor George Washington, the first president of the United States. He was an active and public member of the Shemesh Masonry. And in the book, The New World Order, that the lovely Kristen was able to track down, they mention this one in more detail. This obelisk is a symbol that has definite Masonic connections. It was constructed many years after the president's death on December 14th, 1799, as it was not until 1833 that the Washington National Monument Society was organized to erect a monument in his memory. The monument was not completed until 1848, when the 3300 pound capstone was set in place. The weight of the capstone appears to be semi-symbolic, utilizing the number 33 as a reminder of the 33 degrees inside the Masonic order. The obelisk was constructed of a total of 36,000 separate blocks and included 188 memorial stones inside the monument, donated to the society by individuals, societies, cities, states and nations of the world. Approximately 35 of these came from Masonic lodges and the last of these blocks was placed into the monument at the 330 foot level. Once again, the number 33 shows up in the construction of the obelisk. And once again, it is semi-concealed in a fact about its construction. The total cost of the monument concealed another Masonic number, this time the number 13. The cost of the entire monument was $1.3 million. Hmm. Okay. These Shemish Masons are starting to sound kind of creepy, right? I mean, now I understand why we were warned not to use their name in our videos or we'd get censored. Hence, we made up our word, Shemish Masons. <laughs> <laughs> it is such a cool word, though. I love it. But it's weird. I agree. And it gets even weirder, Jojo. So listen to this. The number 13 appears to be a very symbolic number to the Masons, but finding out why it is has become a difficult chore. One clue is contained in the Bible, in the book of Genesis. That book records in Genesis 14.4 that it was in the 13th year that an amalgamation of various kings rebelled against their leader. It will be recalled that Lucifer rebelled against God in the heavens and some historians equate the number 13 with rebellion and Lucifer. The frequency is weird and, you know, it's sounding a little bit strange. And I'm like, if you don't get this right now, I swear to Lucifer, I'm going to, you know, I get a little bit mad. Stan Deo is one author who explained that the number 13 had a very definite meaning. He wrote this in his book entitled The Cosmic Conspiracy. 13 is the value assigned to represent Satan, the serpent, the dragon, the tempter, or rebellion. Tempter? Serpent? Satan? What the heck is going on here, Casey? I know, I have no idea, but there's even more, Jojo, and I'm sorry, but it gets even more concerning. But there is an extremely important meaning that has not been explained by modern historians. As has been illustrated, the Masons have placed a particular importance on the obelisk, primarily because it has its root in the ancient times in Egypt. However, there is another reason, one that is far more important. The first connection is to the past. Carl Claudy, the Masonic writer, wrote this. The initiate of old saw in the obelisk the very spirit of the god he worshipped. So according to this Masonic writer, the obelisk is a symbol of a god that was worshipped by the believers of the ancient mysteries. It has been shown that those involved in the ancient mysteries worshipped Lucifer. But a far more important reason was revealed to those careful enough to note the importance of the revelation Mr. Claudy then added this comment. From the dawn of religion, the pillar, monolith or built up has played an important part in the worship of the unseen. 
In Egypt, the obelisk stood for the very presence of the sun god himself. Mr. Claudy revealed that the obelisk is a symbol of the sun god and implied that this very deity is present inside the stone itself. The obelisk stands for the very presence of the sun god and the sun god is Lucifer. Mr. Pike confirmed this statement in his book entitled Morals and Dogma. The obelisk was consecrated to the sun and Kenneth Mackenzie, a third Masonic writer, added this supporting statement. Sun worship was plainly connected with the erection of obelisks. They were placed in front of the temples of Egypt. They referred to the worship of the sun. And Mr. Mackey, a fourth Masonic writer, offered this comment. Obelisks were, it is supposed, originally erected in honor of the sun god. So obelisks are a symbol of the very presence of the sun god himself. This is an explanation that is not offered to the overwhelming majority of the American people. Yet one of the major monuments in Washington DC is an obelisk and it was erected to honor George Washington, a very visible member of the Masonic order. And the Masons have concealed various esoteric numbers inside the blocks of the monument itself. Okay, so this shmery, shmery, shmery stuff is creepy, weird, and downright scary. I mean, they don't even try to hide this part of it. What in the world are they doing in secret that they don't want anyone to know about? Worshipping Lucifer? Seriously? I know. It's <sighs> awful, Jojo. <laughs> Especially knowing that almost every city and town in Australia has one of these Masonic lodges in them. I don't get it, Casey. Does that mean that all the obelisks that were built in Australia in the 17 and 1800s were to honour this ancient sun god too? Ra or Lucifer? I mean, what do we even refer to him as? I honestly don't know, Jojo. But... It did remind me of something that I heard in an interview that I watched last year when Campbell and Kelly from Tartaria, Australia, interviewed Stephen and Evan Strong. Now, listen to what they had to say. Yep. All right. So (laughs) when we go to uh, Sydney and um, when the first fleet came in, it's not well known, but it is known in universities too, there were three paintings done of Pinchgut Island, which is an island in the middle of Sydney where they put a fort in later. And those paintings, and we've seen them, Mm. have a 90-metre obelisk that was on top of that particular island. So, look, I'm not saying something that we've made up. This is actually paintings and drawings we've seen by the accredited state or country artists that were chosen by the authorities to depict Australia. And to begin with, you've got to remember, before photographs, all our information is through paintings. Mm. So it's fascinating how we take a lot of the paintings and say, yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right. But the three we know of that were done of the uh, obelisks are basically never discussed. Wow. And obviously we've looked, but we can't find these images anywhere online. They've been hidden from public scrutiny because they don't fit the narrative, huh? I mean. Who built an obelisk that was already here when the first fleet arrived in 1788? I know. I've never seen anything in the history books pertaining to our First Nations people ever building obelisks. So I don't think that it was them. But also, Jojo, did you notice how Stephen Strong was sitting when he was talking about the Pinchgut Island obelisk? Mm Mm-hmm. With his arms across his chest? Yeah, I did notice. Yeah, well, that got me thinking. Now, look, I don't know if I've just got Masonic gestures on my mind because I've been in a shmishmation rabbit hole researching all this week, but that arms across the chest thing is actually a Masonic gesture. And when I looked up what it means, it gave me goosebumps. Oh, my gosh, Casey, why? What does it mean? Okay, so... 
The first sign given is the crossing of the hands over the breast or chest. This sign refers to the penalty assessed if any secrets learned are ever divulged. Do you think Stephen Strong knows more than he's able to share in a public forum? And he used that gesture to let them know that he wouldn't reveal their secrets? I don't know, Jojo, but it was pretty weird. Like he he did it only when he first mentioned the pinch gut obelisk and then the hands came back down. So it was very odd. Now, we mean absolutely no disrespect to the Strongs by saying this. It is merely an observation that we made. And we do know that these two men do a lot of incredible work revealing the hidden history of Australia. But we also know that they've been threatened by the powers that be for some of the artefacts that they have found and the information that they have gained. And they do discuss this further with Campbell and Kelly in this same interview. So we will leave the link for this in the description below. Okay. So I think we pretty much got it figured out that obelisks are ancient Egyptian in origin. They've been adopted by the Shemeshmations along with a lot of the darker aspects of ancient Egyptology, including the Book of the Dead and Ra, the sun god, and also the god of the underworld. I mean, these are occultic ideologies, right? The occult, in the broadest sense, is a category of esoteric supernatural beliefs and practices which generally fall outside the scope of religion and science, encompassing phenomena involving otherworldly agencies such as magic. And what does this mean exactly? So we've got tolerance, equality, charity, and honour all there. Then down the bottom there, you have belief in a supreme being. Hmm. What? The fire truck. <laughs> <laughs> but then there's no elaboration on that. Like, who is the supreme being that you must believe in in order to be a shmishmation? It isn't God or Allah per se, because we are told that you can be of any religious sect to join your local Shemishmation brethren. So is it Ra, the sun god, or Lucifer they're referring to here? And then under that heading, it speaks of something entirely unrelated anyway. I mean, fundraising and international relief support. What's that got to do with belief in a supreme being? Mm. <laughs> oh, I don't know about you, Casey, but this foray into shmishmishmi makes me feel a bit icky, especially when we have their obelisk symbolism all around us. Like this one in Sydney's Hyde Park, erected in 1857. Would you look at that? More Egyptian symbolism. So out of place in colonial Sydney unless Colonial Sydney was frequented by Shmishmations, which from previous episodes, we know it was. So, hmm. Mm -hmm. And check this out. This is in Macquarie Place, Sydney. And what an odd way to mark public roads. No wonder Sydney is chaotic to drive through. <laughs> <laughs> But whilst researching, we came across some info on ley lines. And I know we haven't mentioned ley lines yet, but we do have an episode on ley lines almost ready for release. So if you want to learn more, keep an eye out for that one. But for those of you who may not know what a ley line is, here it is. One of various supposed alignments of ancient monuments and prehistoric sites in straight lines believed by some to indicate paths of positive energy inherent in the earth. This phrase was coined by Alfred Watkins back in the 1800s, a British antiquarian who suggested that ancient monuments and sites are arranged along a network of straight lines. Now, whilst researching ley lines, we came across this video by Jeff Lewis, which we thought very interesting when looking at ley line alignments and obelisks. And a big thank you to Lisa from Tartarian Tales for reminding us about Jeff's research because it fits into this episode perfectly. Thanks, Lisa. So let's take a look at this.
Okay, wow, that is very interesting, huh? A perfect triangle and exact measurements. What does all this mean? Well, to be honest, it's hard to say, Jojo, but I think the point that we're trying to get across to people here is that these obelisks weren't erected just anywhere in a haphazard fashion. It would appear that they're placed in certain locations for a particular reason. Were they a part of an ancient worldwide power grid? You know, did they somehow harness and distribute energy when used properly by the people who originally built them? Can you imagine what a different world we'd be living in if all this was still like this, huh? And it also really makes you wonder if all these obelisks that they tell us were erected in the 1800s really were, or if in fact, just like the elusive Pinchgut Island obelisk, were they actually already here? And if so, why? And who put them there? So many questions, Jojo, but truly it is incredible because these old obelisks are everywhere, like this one in Newcastle, which they say is a navigational aid. And do you remember early this year when we were travelling through South Australia, Jojo, and I went to see the Robe obelisk? Mm Mm-hmm, I sure do. Okay, so they say that that obelisk is also a navigational aid, said to have been erected in 1855 after being carted to the site by a 32 Bullock wagon team. So it used to be all white, apparently, but the mariners were unhappy with that as they found it difficult to see. So in 1862, they repainted it with alternate red and white stripes. And now they say it can be seen from 20 kilometres away on a clear day. So, Jojo, I put this to the test, and after we checked out the obelisk, we went over to Long Beach, which is still in Robe, and I took this photo of the obelisk. Now, as you can see, it's a pretty clear day, and we're at a distance of about six kilometres away as the crow flies. Can you see the obelisk there, Jojo? (laughs) No, I cannot. (laughs) Exactly. So, I really don't think that this obelisk was used as a navigational aid. I mean, I could barely see it from 6Ks away, let alone 20Ks like they're saying. You know, I have to agree with you there, Casey. These obelisks were clearly used for something else and I think we've all been lied to about it. I mean, they are everywhere and in some really obscure places too. Look at this one at North Head in Manly, Sydney. This one too is quite mysterious and it's not known exactly when it was erected, but it's estimated to be between 1807 and 1809. And once again, they are calling it a navigational aid. Then we've got this one at Middlehead in Mossman, said to have been erected in 1801 as part of the Middlehead batteries. What obelisks have to do with fortifications, I'm really not sure. But that's the story we've been told and until now we've all just believed it. And thanks to our mate Scotty for getting this great video footage of the Middlehead Obelisk 2 for us. Yeah, thanks Scotty. So due to this obelisk, this area is called Obelisk Bay and nearby there is also Obelisk Beach, which we learnt whilst researching is actually a nudist beach. And according to Wikipedia, it is attended predominantly by homosexual men, which is interesting, isn't it, Jojo? Knowing what we know about what the obelisk is representative of. So this beach is somewhere where men can go to erect their own obelisk, so to speak. (laughs) Okay, moving on, shall we? So, Casey, what about the obelisks all over Australia that are supposedly monuments to the fallen men and women from our world wars? Yeah, good question. And when trying to find out the answer, it was quite elusive. The only definitive answer to this question that we could find officially was on the Queensland War Memorial Register website. And all it said was what we already know about what obelisks represent and not why they're used for war memorials. So also are obelisks one of the most popular types of war memorials, though sometimes they bear military symbols such as crossed rifles 
Obelisks have their origin in ancient Egyptian sun worship and represent shafts of the sun's rays, hence they also signify fertility. So not an actual answer there at all. But I have heard a theory, Jojo. I cannot confirm or deny whether this is true, but as we know, obelisks were built originally in ancient Egypt to honour the king of the dead, the sun god Ra, Osiris, or Lucifer. I mean, as we've learnt today, he goes by so many names, right? But remember what we learnt earlier, that the spirit of this god was supposed to enter the obelisks at certain periods. And on these occasions, human sacrifices were offered to the obelisk. They say that the victims used for these sacrifices were most probably prisoners of war, other foreigners, or even their own people. So the theory goes that today's war memorial obelisks actually represent the modern day human sacrifice that comes from war. It's almost like they're erecting these obelisks with the names of the deceased soldiers etched into them as a modernized way of honoring their God. And if there is any truth to that theory, Casey, that is sick. Yeah, it really is, Jojo. And unfortunately, I feel like this episode has actually left us with more questions than answers, because what about all the older images of obelisks that we've come across during our research? Yeah, like the one that was at Garden Palace, for example? Yeah, exactly. Well, I wonder what happened to that. I mean, we know that it survived the fire, right? And then what? Because it was huge. But it's never mentioned again. Was it relocated and destroyed maybe? And what is with the obelisks that were displayed inside the Garden Palace International Exhibition 2? I mean, I get the feeling that obelisks were kind of a big deal back in the day, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. And what about the obelisks that we spotted at old mate George Lancel's gold mines? We mentioned him back in our Gold Rush episode. Um, and these gold mines were ones that he owned back in the 1800s. You know, where are these obelisks now? But an even better question, Casey, is why they were there in the first place. Why are these monuments that we now know are basically dedicated to honouring a really awful sounding deity in a way that can only be described as occultism dotted all over our realm? Oh, I don't know, Jojo, but I do know that my brain is fried from researching <laughs> this episode. And even though we are a little closer to answering some of our questions, We've also been left with so many more. And to be honest with you, I don't like where these answers are heading. I mean, we appear to be completely surrounded by occult symbolism that has permeated all of our lives, yet most of us have no idea whatsoever. Yeah, it is quite shocking, isn't it, when you actually think about it? We are all being subliminally influenced constantly. It's nothing short of evil. But I think we'll have to leave it there for this week, Casey. It has been a huge episode full of all sorts of interesting bits and pieces. And I think I need to go make myself a cup of tea after all that. Oh, Jojo, I need something stronger than a cup of tea. A wine, maybe? <laughs> I'll join you for that too. Uh... But thanks for sticking with us throughout this pretty deep and dark episode, guys. We really appreciate you sticking around and we will see you all next time. See you later. Bye. These obelisks would also symbolise bowies. Oh, yeah. Boaz and Joachim. The, is that how I say it? Yeah, I reckon. That sounded good. Yeah. So the Shemishmations are really into ancient Egyptology. Oh. Yeah, that's right. So this one is in St. Peter's Square at the Vatican in Rome. Did I just say Vatican? 
Okay. So I, live, I said Vatican instead of Vatican. Oh, did you? <laughs> so there should be a slide. Yep. So I'm like sitting bated breath. <laughs> <laughs> but I forget I'm changing the slide. Sorry. <laughs> okay. You're funny. <laughs> Sorry. This is serious. I've got to get back to my serious face. Ready? Okay. <sighs> serious face activated. <laughs> the <clears throat> you got this, girl. Thank you. <laughs>